Right, we've finished now all characterization tests and we're now going to look at the complementary presentation, which is about how are you going to use the values that are going to come out of this test to do something useful. If you remember what I said, the test on its own has no value whatsoever. You need an engineering equation to be able to actually do something with those results. And the theme of this, and we're going to look at some engineering equations um, and look at how many tests that you need to do. The theme really is at the end of the day is how do you minimize the uncertainty associated with those engineering equations that you are going to use those SMC tests, drop weight tests, bond tests, whatever the tests are. To do it, we're going to do an experiment. I'm going to do a worked example with you later on. And we're going to use a very big database, which we're going to play, if you like, a game, a simulation. And we're going to look at a fictitious worked example, but we're going to use a real deposit that we know an awful lot of information about. And that deposit comes from the SMC test uh, database. We believe it's probably the biggest database of its kind in the world. We're actually now up to 52,000 tests that we've done since 2003. And we are just about approaching 2,000 separate deposits around the world. Uh, we've put the database together uh, according to commodities. You can see here all the different commodities that we've tested over the years. There's well over 45 of them. And we've also uh, put them together in terms of location around the world. And there's, didn't realize there were quite so many places that do mining. There's over 100 countries around the world uh, where mining takes place and where SMC tests have been done. Now, we're going to dip into some statistics and most classical statistics require that the data is normally distributed. You don't have to have a normal distribution, but it certainly helps if you have a normal distribution. And there is the normal distribution. Uh, this is the drop weight index. So you can see there, and, and I can assure you, it's as about as normal as you're ever going to get. So there's the DWI distribution. There's the MIA, again normal. MIH, C, sorry, is normal. MIH, normal. A times B, I told you before, is non-linear. And you can see there that is very much not the normal distribution. It is highly skewed. If you're interested in distributions, it follows what's called a Burr distribution. Burr was a statistician from the US who did some work uh, back in the 1930s, I think it was. This to me is the, ver the most important distribution that we've managed to get out of the database. What we did was to look at every single deposit and look at the mean and the standard deviation within that deposit and calculate what the coefficient of variation is for each of those deposits. And this is the histogram. These are the percentage of those 2,000 deposits, and this is the coefficient of variation. So the variability, the width of the hardness uh, data. From a common ocean viewpoint, everybody loves deposits with a very, very narrow spread of hardnesses. If you have a very wide spread from an operator's viewpoint, from a designer's viewpoint, it makes life very difficult indeed. But you do have to overcome that in the design of your comminution circuit. You can see here it's highly skewed and it has at least two modes. You can see two clearly here. If you look more closely, there are actually several other modes and there's a very good reason for that multimodal shape. We don't have time to go through it. The thing that is of most important to us for this exercise is that it gives us uh, the ability of uh, finding, if you like, a starting point where we know nothing about our deposit, a green field situation. So let's put ourselves in a position of either a senior engineer on the mine or 
senior person in a laboratory who's been given the job, an engineering company, you have a deposit in a green field. There's nothing else to go on. You know nothing about that deposit. And you have to put together a program, a drilling program, select some samples so you can start to learn about that deposit. How many tests? How many tests do I now recommend that we do? There are four drivers. Resolution, accuracy, the risk of getting it wrong, and the variability of the deposit. I'm going to go through each of those four now in turn. What do I mean by resolution? Well, resolution means what's the time period associated with this mine that I'm looking at in terms of being able to provide a prediction? Because that's what you'll be doing at the end, and mostly you're going to have to predict the throughput. That's what the mine wants to know. Given a comminution circuit, what's the throughput? Depending on how the project is structured, from a design viewpoint, that time that you're looking at, that that period of throughput that you're looking at, might be for the whole life of mine. Your boss might say, I want to know on average what's going to be the throughput of my grinding circuit for the entire life of that mine. It could be for the payback period, or it could be for the first three years. Now, if you've got throughput and you've got time and you multiply throughput by time, you end up with a tonnage. And that tonnage basically is a volume, and that's the volume in your pit that you, this exercise now relates to. That's where you take your samples and that's where you have to work out how many must I take from that volume. From a geomet viewpoint, that's a difficult question to answer. Your boss might have asked you, I want to generate a geomet model to forecast on a yearly basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Once again, if you know the throughput of your circuit, and you have that time period, it then gives you a tonnage, which you convert to a volume, and that volume in the pit is your resolution. Accuracy. All mining companies in a greenfield situation go through stages, and there are generally three stages to any project. Scoping, right at the very beginning. Pre-feasibility feasibility, and then a decision's made. Every company has their own guidelines for what the accuracy should be for that project. Not just from comminution, from all sorts of things, financial, whatever. At the scoping study, your accuracy doesn't need to be that great. You're just having a quick look-see. Do we think this project maybe have a chance of going through? And talking to a lot of mining companies, that typically is the range that mining companies would apply for that stage in the project. When you get to pre-feasibility, you need to be a bit more accurate. And that's the typical range that's applied. And when you get to the end, when you're now trying to persuade a bank to lend your company sometimes billions of dollars, you need to be really, really clear. You need to have a very high degree of accuracy in your prediction. So we've done resolution, we've done accuracy. So how does the number of tests fit into that? Well, classical statistics gives us the answer. That equation there is a classical statistical equation that relates accuracy that's what we talked about before. Two, variability. That's the coefficient of variation, the variability of your deposit. N is the number of samples. That's what we're interested in. And last but not least, CL here, the confidence level. You've all heard about confidence level, confidence interval. That is the risk associated with getting it wrong. 
You want to get as right as you possibly can. I know that's not good English, but I'm certain you know what I mean. And the higher that confidence level is, the less risk will be associated of you getting that answer wrong. And quite often, mining companies will also give you guidelines as to what that level should be. 90, 95, 99, and so on. T here is the T statistic. And T statistic needs two numbers for it to be generated. It needs a confidence level and it needs a degree of freedom. And degrees of freedom is the number of samples minus one. You as an engineer, if you want to know the answer, have to input all of that before you can work out the numbers. That equation is really quite simple and within five minutes you can put it in a spreadsheet which is basically what I've done and in the near future that equation is going to be up on our website so you can check if you want to put that equation into your own spreadsheet and just check if I got it right we'll have it up on the website and you can basically do your own worked example and make sure you get the same numbers that we do let's do a worked example we're going to go through a scoping pre-fees Feasibility. The boss has said, I want 30% for scoping, 20% for pre-fees, and 10% for feasibility. And it's got to be done at the 95% confidence interval. That's the risk, small risk associated with that. To do this exercise, obviously, if we were given this exercise in the green field, we would know nothing about the deposit. We, in this case, do know something. This comes from the SMC test database base. It's a Chilean copper company. I'm not going to tell you which one. It's got over 2,000 samples associated with it. And we know it has a beautifully normal distribution. And we are going to use that to sample from. And we're going to generate some statistics. And we're going to play a game going through scoping, pre-fees, and then feasibility study. I know there's a lot going on on this slide, but let's go through it step by step. This is a screen dump from my Excel spreadsheet that I put the equations, this equation in. If you're familiar with Excel and you're familiar with statistics, you'll know that Excel function. It's called T inverse 2T. And basically, Excel generates the T statistic for you if you give it the degrees of freedom and the confidence level. So here, the green cells, this is where I put in the confidence level. That is the variability. I put in the number of samples that I'm going to take. The T statistic is generated by Excel. And all those numbers are put into that equation, which sits in that cell. I'm really very easy. So let's look at our scoping study. You've got a green field. You know nothing about that deposit. Nothing. So you have to make an assumption. I'm going to make the assumption that because I've got this massive database of the deposits all over the world, the average for that entire worldwide database is 31%. I'm going to assume I've got an average deposit. I put 31% in there, I choose 95% confidence level, and I change this number here until I get 30%. I know it's 29, but it's a, as it's a digital uh, calculation, if I put in 8 there, then that would um, accuracy would go up to about 32, I think it is. So the nearest to 30 has got 7. So I take 7 random samples from my database, and it generates um, a coefficient of variation. Actually, my sample coefficient of variation is just over 46%. What that actually means is my variability is higher than I actually thought it was. And for that scoping study, the actual accuracy was only 43%. Don't worry. Let's say the boss says it's okay. We're going ahead with the pre-feasibility study. You don't need to worry. So we're now going to pre-feasibility. Pre-feasibility says we now want 20% accuracy. So we put 20% in here. We put what we now know, or we think we know, is 46% here. 
We adjust the sample number here to give us the accuracy required, and the number that comes up is 23 samples we now know need for this part of the project. You've already got seven from the scoping study. So, 23 less seven, you only need 16. You've now got a lot more samples to play with. You reanalyze them and you find actually that you now know a bit more about the deposit. It's only 34%. So you, for the next stage, the feasibility study, you use 34% as your starting point. You now need a much higher degree of accuracy. So now your accuracy is 10%. What does that mean from numbers? Well, the calculations is you now need 47. You've already got 23. So now 47 less 23, you only need an extra 24 samples. Take your samples. You now look again at what the variability is in your deposit and you find it's round about 36%. If you now use 36% in our equation, what it says is for that project, you didn't get 10% accuracy, you got 11. Now at that point, you can either say 10, 11, really doesn't matter. If your boss says, no, you have to get 10%, you use your latest coefficient of variation, put it back into the equation, and it says, well, you need 54 then. And 54 is the final number from a statistical viewpoint that you require to get that accuracy. There's a problem. Classical statistics requires certain assumptions. Normal distribution is a good starting point. Also, the properties that you're looking at have to be randomly and smoothly distributed throughout that deposit. Very few deposits satisfy that. This is Antamina. This is a published uh, um, graph figure. It comes from the SAG conference. And you can see this false color map says there's all sorts of different domains here. The hardness in each of these domains is different. It's not smoothly distributed throughout that deposit. So strictly speaking, you should be doing that previous exercise at the pale blue with the white with the dark blue. So this classical statistical method is a good starting point, but you need to use your own judgment and you may well have to expand on that. The other thing you might find is that there's a variability with depth. We often see this. It might well be for that depth there, it's randomly distributed, but over the entire deposit, it, it won't be. So once again, from a sampling viewpoint, you may well have to go through every year, year by year by year by year, to build up uh, until you have a complete picture of that deposit.